Okay, delighted to bring our Lanky Legend series to an end with a modern day legend of our club. One of the most consistent performances on the pitch and of course a catalyst as skipper for the first championship title in 2011, first one for 77 years. Wildly regarded as the best bowler never to play test cricket for England, uh, former Lancashire captain, now head coach, Lancashire cricket, Glenn Chappell. Chappie, how are you doing, pal? I'm very well, thanks, Warren. Um, busy at the moment, but uh, and you know all the Lancashire team are busy now after a long time of sat on the backsides and staying indoors. So things are picking up, and obviously everyone's looking forward to Lancashire playing some cricket. Absolutely, mate. And any and any cricket will be great to watch. And you personally at the moment are uh, uh, hold up at the um, the, the Hilton Garden. Here. The England boards, which must be great for you. Yeah, it's a good experience actually. Um, you know, good to uh, go back to bowling coaching for a period of time. Obviously, working with with England's finest, um, real good experience and a challenge to sort of get to know a group of bowlers and try and help them uh, prepare for, for test matches. Well, bag, bags of experience that you, you bring to the party there and, and, and great that England have, uh, have got you involved. But what's it like being in a bubble? What's it like being in that secure bubble? Uh, you know, we've seen it on television now behind closed doors, but it gives a feel of what it's like. Yeah, well, it's got its challenges, obviously, because we are um, following fairly strict protocols. Uh, we're wearing masks, as everyone's probably heard, um, following all the rules about sanitising and um, keeping it within our own social group, so there's different social groups within the within the um, ground and the area. Yeah. Um, that's media, England team, West Indies team, ground staff, all have to keep to themselves really, and uh, so that poses some uh, some challenges. When the games come, it's much easier because we're you know we're out we're out on the ground at eight in the morning. We're not back till after seven at night, so you're busy through that period, but during the training days and the afternoons, uh, there's there's um, there's not much to do, and uh, you, you're not allowed off site, so you've got to find that some way of occupying yourself. Um, they, they tell they tell me they, they brought a couple of golf simulators in there. Have you not have you not had a go at one of them yet? Well, as good as they are, it's not for me, mate. I mean, there's you know all sorts of games in the in the in the room. I'm sure the lads are enjoying them, but that that they're not really my cup of tea. I'm uh, I'll be ready after 13 more days to get out on a proper golf course. Um, but you know, the, both grounds we've been at have done a fantastic job in in trying to make this experience as good as it can be. Um, and obviously, the main the main reason for it is that everybody wants uh, to see some cricket and. and Obviously, the first test televised, and it was a good game of cricket, albeit the wrong result for England. But um, but at least we're playing and uh, and giving English cricket supporters something to watch. Absolutely, mate. And we'll touch a little bit on that later on uh, towards the end. But we're here to talk about you and your career, your fantastic career um, with Lancashire. Like we've said before, one of the most uh, most successful bowlers that the clubs ever had. But it started uh, it started early for you. Give us a give us a bit of a feel as to as to where it all started. Like most people um, from from within Lancashire, we came through the uh, schoolboy system. Um, so I started with Lancashire Schoolboys at 12, um, which was all good fun and really enjoyable uh, period. Um, probably around 16, I started to think that I might have a chance of, of becoming a professional. Um, but it all seems pretty daunting at that age, or it did for me. I come from right on the edge of Lancashire, where uh, in those days, not many people uh, made it through to become to become professionals, so I didn't. I didn't know anybody else who was a professional cricketer. Um, and signing your first contract was at seventeen was fantastic. I remember meeting um, Jeff Hogden and uh, was it David David Hughes, I think, or or Alan right. Ormrod, both of them. Yeah. Um, signed the first contract, um, and then it all happened really quickly from there. Uh, finished A levels and. Next thing I know, um, I'm playing a second team game over at Crosby and Alan Ormrod came around the boundary and told me that I was travelling down to play first team the day after. Um, 
I think you'll remember very well because you were captain in that game. So my <laughs> debut, my debut was 1992 at Hove yeah. on an absolute belter with, uh, and we had a, a fairly weakened team through England call ups and, and illness and injury. Uh, we had quite a young team out, and obviously I was 18 making my debut. I remember, I remember it because I've got, I've got a picture of us all walking down the steps at Hove on, onto the field, and obviously, like, you, like you mentioned, I was captain, and, and there was a, there was a young Glen Chapel, looked about fifteen, with a, with a Lancashire red rose on, about to uh, t take a new ball for Lancashire, and remember that game, amazingly, because like you said, we were ravaged by uh, England call-ups, injuries, and uh, and Winker pulled out on the morning of the game, couldn't get out of bed through some. Some buggy dabs. So I was the uh, I was next cab off the rank because uh, I never captained anyone in, in my life. All of a sudden I'm walking out there, <laughs> going to make changes and everything. I think um, I think there was a couple of uh, raised eyebrows. But what what, what, did you, what did you feel like when you when you got told you can actually play for Lancashire? Was there any fear there, or is it just it's just another game? Uh, no, the people. I think it was easier because the team wasn't full of the. Uh, established stars and the older brigade, if you like. So it wasn't quite as daunting as it could have been because I did know more than half the team through playing second team with them and they were closer to my age. So the first game was actually relatively stress-free. Uh, I think it was, a, if I remember rightly, it was a flat pitch and bowlers weren't really supposed to dominate that game. So, And I was always reasonably confident about my bowling. Uh, what made me ner more nervous in those days was actually fielding and, and not wanting to make a mistake of somebody else's bowling. Um, but I don't, I don't remember feeling horrendously nervous in that game. I think the next game I played was soon after at, at Edgebaston and we had all our stars back and we were playing against Alan Donald, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Um, maybe. Uh, but that, that game had... Um, I think Athers was back in the team for that one. Um, well, this was a game where did Winker get a hat trick that day? Do you remember might. that? Game? I think he might have done actually. Yeah, uh, uh, Edge Baston. Yeah, I think he did. I think he did yeah. get that. So I mean, I really, I, I was more nervous for that one, but I enjoyed it more because I, I think I got five wickets in the game. Yeah, and that sort of made me realise that I could, I could hold my own. Um, but it was it was a it was an amazing year straight out of A levels and into the first team. Yeah, it was a, a meteoric rise, de definitely. But it, it started for you, didn't it? At uh, like you like you said, you were you were on the border of Lancashire and Yorkshire, up at um, up at Eby. Was it? Was it uh, did you follow your your dad into the game? Was it something that that most young cricketers do? Yeah, my dad played for Eby uh, when he was younger. Um, then he moved to play for. I'm not sure how many seasons, maybe five or six seasons at Nelson. Um, then he then he was professional at Darwin, um, and then I think he went back to Nelson, maybe, and then back to Aby. But I played, um, I played in the first team with my dad at probably the age of six, 15, 16. Yeah, I played for two or three seasons with him, so that was a, a good experience. What what was he like? Was he like every dad? Was he like your your biggest critic, or was he a massive support for you? Or between, really, he didn't go overboard in either in either area, and never remember him criticizing me, or and never never remember too much praise. I think he probably wanted to keep me keep me pretty level. Yeah. Um, the best thing was he was able to bowl at me in the net. So once once we'd finished practice, he'd stay behind, and I'd get another forty or fifty minutes batting, and he was you know. He was, when I was 15, 16, he was probably still able to bowl the best part of 78, 75, 80 miles an hour. So he was perfect practice. So that was a, a big advantage. Obviously, he played a lot of cricket and he knew the game. So um, it was a good, uh, a good start. You played, you went on from there to, uh, to represent England under 19s in a team that, 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 that made some, some very good cricket. Do you, what do you recall about your, your England under 19 days? Well, again, um, I went to New Zealand when I was 16. So, yeah. uh, bizarrely, I was I was two years young. And the two England under-19 opening bowlers were myself and a lad called Mark Broadhurst from Yorkshire. Yeah, yeah. And he was even younger than me. So, we, were, we had two 16-year-olds opening the bowling. 
and New Zealand had two 19-year-olds who bowled 90 miles an hour. Um, so I think our batters were probably a bit disappointed about that. Uh, but we had, you know, it was the first time I'd ever flown and it was a 33-hour flight into Christchurch from, from London uh, via, uh, where would it be, via um, Kuala Lumpur or, or Hong Kong and then wow. Perth and then... Um, into Auckland and then down to Christchurch. Uh, so it was, that was a that was a fair old experience. I uh, remember all the lads falling asleep in the in their evening meal when we got there. And then six weeks touring around New Zealand as a sixteen year old. So absolutely brilliant trip. Put you into put you into great stead, didn't it? And really give you get give you lots of experience to come back uh, to just to slot into into a very successful Lancashire team. And at the time, and and you became part and part and part of the furniture really very early on in your career, didn't you? And you, you didn't look back. But it was some was that something that you um, once you got in, you thought I need to stay here now and uh, and, and learn a way of, of bowling at first class cricket. Um, yeah, I think I had a period where obviously I I did well early on, and as a lot of young players do, they have uh, inconsistencies with form. Um, and I remember being a bit up and down for three or four years, maybe a bit longer than that. Good season, average season. Um, and and I, was, I was definitely always part of the first team squad, but I wasn't always part of the first team. And it took me probably until 24 before I became almost, you know, a permanent member of the team. And being at a big club, you are at the mercy of... of you know, you're fighting for your place with other good cricketers. Absolutely. Um, and I think eventually I learnt my lesson that uh, every day of training had to become absolutely imperative because you're not only satisfying yourself that, that you're in good form, people are watching. And if you have a bad day of training, that can affect selection. So um, the biggest learner I had was probably um, after being left out was... I'd made a decision that whenever I bowled at the captain, he'd never, he'd never, they'd never get a bad ball ever again. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can up with some bad news the morning after. So um, I think that was the best realization I, I came to. Well, I, I remember what, uh, very early on in your career, we had um, in, in the heady days of, uh, of uh, when we didn't go away on pre-season tour, we went up to Ample Fourth. Remember, we go up to Ample Fourth and. Um, uh, and they had an in, a, a gym in there that I remember me and you did a weight session and we did a, a, an upper body session and I was a, an established first team cricketer but I couldn't even lift the weight you were lifting off the bench press uh, and was that a big part and, and a big me mental approach for you to get stronger to to maintain the, 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 the pace that you always had? Well again you learn from your mistakes don't you so I, I remember coming back from Pakistan uh, from an under nine trip there and we'd all been suffering with a bit of illness in Pakistan Miss myself and Mark Harvey who, who had a few years on the staff with us uh, we were doing the Chalton run which you'll remember well um, yeah. Tuesday night, Tuesday and Thursday we used to rock up and, and do the Chalton run and we're, we're me and Mark are running around in a bit of discomfort and before we know it, Yozza and uh, Laurie Brown, the physio, caught us up um, and they weren't very impressed that two 18-year-olds were getting caught by the physio and the um, and the coach. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Uh, that was a bit of a shock, and I went instantly into I've got to get fit mode. Uh, mm. So I did put a lot of work into into fit into fitness, weights, um, and and a lot of running. So where I come from, there's a lot of hills, much more than there are in Cheshire. So um, I just got into that and worked hard, and um, and I became, you know, one of the fitter members of the squad. Uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, you did definitely, definitely. But and we, we just move forward a little bit now to when you were um, when you were part and parcel of that team, like we've said, the 1996 National Trophy. You uh, you 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 had a bowling spell there that 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 for me was one of the best. Uh, spells that I've kept wicket to, and it happened to be in a showcase final uh, at Lords in front of full house against, against it in '96. What do you remember about that? Well, it was humid, wasn't it? And um, so we batted first, and uh, 
the ball was going around for the Essex bowlers. Yeah. And obviously, uh, John Crowley played a, an innings that, that gave us a, well, played a great innings, really. And it, it was just a, a score that we thought would just keep us in it. Mm. Um, and we expected the weather to lift and, it, and for it to be good batting conditions in the afternoon. But fortunately for us, the, the cloud cover just stayed nice and low and it was, it was quite warm. Um, <laughs> what I really remember is ruining Digger's day. Because poor old poor old Digger had three for three for spit and then got taken off. <laughs> I remember that he was coming in. He was coming in from the pavilion end, wasn't he? He was bowling from the pavilion yeah. end at Lords, uh, and he was yeah, he so, had it on a string. Yeah, so him and Bully started really well, um, and then obviously Winker had to make changes because you don't want to you don't want to blow out your two senior bowlers. And then leave your youngsters with something to do, in in case you know Gooch was still in, and yeah, uh, in case they have a partnership and the ball goes soft. So, you know, it was the right call to save Digger and Bully some some back in case it got tough again. Um, and I came on from the from the nursery end, and um, I got oh I got Ronnie with a grubber, so. Yeah, he did. Yeah, told him at the time that it just decked away and took his off stump, but it actually went under his back. I think I think Richie Richie Benno gave me the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> so it was a bit of a lucky start. So I think I bowled a loosener and got and got put away for four. A bit of nerves early on, and um, then the, then Ronnie got that one at kept low, which was a bit fortunate for me. And then even the next wicket. Um, a little bit wide and a, probably a leaveable ball, but Darren Robinson had a had a flash at it, and I think he, he nicked it to Harvard's yeah. first second slip. First slip. Second slip, yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah, yeah. But then you know you're two wickets in, and the crowd are going mental, and it, you just switched on, and the nerves have gone, and it's just run at the stumps and try and knock them out, and uh, and I did. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you did. And I and I still to this day, people say, what's the best ball you've ever kept wicket to? And it was um, it was Robert Rollins, you know, um, the wicketkeeper for, for for Essex. And I'm and I swear I can still see that ball now. As it left your hand, it was going down leg side. It was on leg stump and it swung and it hit the off the top of off stump. And Rolly played it beautifully with a full maker's name. And when it hit the stumps, he I can recall he just smiled because he thought, "How has that bowled me out? That was that was as good a ball as he must have ever bowled." Yeah, well, um, me and Rolly were good mates, so we came we came out of the under 19s team. We played England schoolboys together for five years, um, so it's you know a bit of friendly rivalry. So I just remember him smiling and thinking, "Chappy, why?" <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was it was one of those perfect balls, and it's one that you get advised not to try. But it was doing, it, you know, it was doing a fair bit, and it was bowler friendly conditions you've got to control it and you know the thing I was happy about was able being able to do that in such a big game so um you know but to be able to bowl balls like that you need conditions in your favour don't you well you were happy about it we were absolutely ecstatic stood at the other end as you kept as you kept knocking them through and and getting six six for spit and we we we, we one other trophy. you moved into that team and you became the uh we used to giggle about it didn't you, you became one of one of the guys that chose the suits before we'd go down to Lords, and uh, yeah, you used to get a bit of stick for that, didn't you, from the older members of the team? But I think you brought a few of us into the uh, in, into the fashion fashion at that time instead of the big pedals and stuff like that. Yeah, well, I remember you getting a bit of stick for your suits, Eggy. You were you were wearing your final suits ten years later. You're still wearing them now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just a bit small. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't go as far as the Liverpool team, did we? We, we we never ended up in white suits anyway, so no, we didn't. I think I think a couple more years if we'd have been there. I think we'd have, if if you were in charge, we would have been in them white suits. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> and I remember remember coming towards the end of my career and 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 playing at Lords in a in a red ball championship game, and having just having five minutes thinking this is the last time I'm going to play in the home of cricket. And the great days, the A finals that, that I was lucky to play in, uh, we had some fantastic days, and to, and I took stock for uh, you know for a good ten minutes, and and remembered those, those brilliant, brilliant fun that we. Had. Um, yeah, I think I'm, that's one of the reasons I'm lucky in the in the job that I do now because I still get to visit those places, and there are still there are still people you meet who you played against. So 
um, you do still get the chance to sit in the Lord's dressing room. And and I often think I'm quite relieved that I'm not going out there to bowl. Um, <laughs> I can still sit in the same chair and, and now watch the lads doing it. I'm not having that. You could still do a job now. You could still do a job off eight yards coming down that slope and nipping it back. Yeah, probably got a spell in me, but I wouldn't like to take the new ball after tea. <laughs> You work really closely with, uh, with, with, uh, with, with our coach at the time and had a really good relationship with, with, with Peter Moore. How did that go for you? Yeah, well, to start with, Winker offered me the captaincy um, before Christmas and then he moved to director of cricket and we, uh, we signed Morsey as head coach. So at the start, I was, I was wondering whether, you know, that, well, I wasn't Morsey's choice. Um, so there was a little bit of hesitancy and I was wondering whether whether you know how I was the man he wanted to lead the team um so when we did the press conference with Morsey and myself and him had a meeting about about the team he reassured me that he was more than happy for me to to do the job mm. um and I was 35 Eggy so yeah. I, I almost had the opinion that if I don't do it now I don't want to play under anyone else because I was I was always happy to play for all the captains I played for yeah. um because I just wanted to do my job. But when you get to a certain age, you think, I think I'd be pretty, I'd be okay at it now. Um, and didn't really have the fear of my own form dipping because I was, I was experienced. I thought my body might give way before form would. Um, so I was, I was energized by it, if I'm honest. And Mosey was brilliant with me in terms of how he, how he let me go about my business. Uh, he encouraged me to work hard and, and make sure I trained because he said that he believed I could play until I was 40. So I managed to outdo him and play until I was 41. So I was happy yeah. about that. Yeah. Um, but we did, we, we saw eye to eye. I mean, he he opened my eyes on, on what he expected. He expected a team to work hard and fight. Um, and that should go without saying, but I think I think teams from time to time can become a bit complacent if they, if they don't have direction. Um, so together we 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 tried to pick up the intensity a little bit, um, and I enjoyed the responsibility of of making sure everything was right, and it made me it made me put in even more to be honest. So um, six years as captain, and I thoroughly enjoyed every one, and I didn't find it particularly stressful. It was you had things to do and decisions to make and um, relationships to manage, which. Um, without that responsibility, I could be a bit careless with relationships sometimes, a bit a bit snappy and a bit speaking my mind when probably it's not wise to. Um, but that gave me a different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. That that's that's really interesting to listen to. And it, and it, you, the culmination of that was that you went on to captain to win the, the championship in 2011 for the first time in 77 years, which was a a magnificent feat, a magnificent effort from 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 you and all your uh, all your team in then, um, and there were some really good performances from uh, from players during that time. And it looked you've just mentioned it. It looked like you 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 had set the scene where you had each other. Everyone had, had everyone else's back. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> before that, um, we've both played in teams who should have won the championship. Yeah. Uh, and you look back and think. Cracky, that some of the seasons we've had, um, sometimes we underperformed, and then other times when we did perform, we didn't get the breaks we we thought we deserved. And you've got to get over all that. But some of the teams we've played in who didn't manage to win it, I still think that's that it was amazing. I know one of the lads I'm working with here um, mentioned it the other day. I think when Sussex won it, they were staring at our results and just watching it rain in Manchester when they knew we were playing great cricket and they won the championship. Ultimately, because they played more cricket than we did. Yeah. Um, so there were two or three seasons where we just couldn't we couldn't get on the field. And then two or three where we actually let ourselves down and didn't quite do it when we needed to. Um, my first two years as captain, I think we finished fourth both times with, with good teams. Um, but fourth was probably a, tr a fair reflection on where we were at at the time. But the year we won it, we started off as relegation favourites, I think, because we'd lost, we'd lost big-name players. Um, and we had a young squad. We only had 17 on staff. Um, we had no batting depth to speak of in terms of 
what where people's careers were at. We had we had young players making the way, um, and I think I think Gailey, the Yorkshire captain at the time, tipped us for relegation, which really wound wound a few of our young lads up. <laughs> Bet it um, did. And probably set off a bit of a <clears throat> a bit of a temporary fallout between us and Yorkshire, which spiced the season up no end, to be honest. <clears throat> um, with a bit of help from Jimmy, um, getting a bit irate at Liverpool. <clears throat> um, but the the lads were amazing that year. They 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 decided that they wanted to compete for the championship, and they weren't just going to be relegation fodder. They were going to win the championship. And after the first two games at Liverpool, they built up this sort of momentum. They proved they could score runs. Uh, we didn't score massive runs all year, but we scored competitive runs. We had a really solid bowling unit and we had energy in the field and we had a drive that um, was about fighting for each other and winning games. So, And that comes from, from lads who were really energetic and, and determined to play well for each other. You've mentioned it a couple of times now. You mentioned that that word fight, and you know you you never beaten. And on many occasions during that during that season, um, you you pulled great, uh, great victories out of the bag when you shouldn't really have won. Yeah, um, there's too many to mention, really. But you know the the ones that stand out are Keggs's performance late on in the season um, against Hampshire. Um, I mean, the last game was incredible, really. How we hung on, how we hung on in that game, and and managed to force a result on a flat pitch. That's that's purely down to to desperation to win. The two Yorkshire games were absolutely cracking matches, um, and a lot of close games where a team weak in spirit would have would have rolled over. Um, we managed to we managed to hang in when it was tough, and then dominate and um, and win the big moments. Which, which, which is fantastic. And moving on to your coaching career now, it, that's a philosophy that you, you look like you've taken into your coaching philosophy now of, of, of everyone gives 135%. No game he's ever, ever lost or no game he's ever won before the, before the final whistle, so to speak. And is that something that you'll stick with in your coaching role? Yeah, I think you evolve, though, as a player and you evolve as a coach. And, I mean... I think I'll always say coaching's about helping and um, and when a team does well, it's the players who've done well. Um, I think the players get the message that um, my view that is that it's about the team and what you can do for the team is everything. Um, and by doing that, you'll achieve your own personal ambitions. So um, I think that message will remain constant and... You know, players are professional cricketers and they should enjoy working hard. And, you know, we want them to enjoy every day they come into work. Mm. But it has to be centred around a focus, and a focus for improvement and a focus for the team and, and what you want to achieve together. And as long as, as long as there is that targeted approach to it, then we want to see people having fun with it and enjoying being proud of what they're, what they're trying to do. This, this, this coaching uh, pathway that you've gone down now, you've always been a student of, of the bowling side of the game and you've always, you've just mentioned the last half an hour, you, you worked it out for yourself and you worked how to become a successful bowler. As a coach, that must really, really help that you've got, you've got a massive knowledge behind what young bowlers are thinking, what young bowlers are going through and what challenges they're all facing. Yeah, but I think the biggest challenge is to remember that you don't know everything and you only know stuff from your perspective if you're not careful. So uh, things come to you really quickly about what you'd do, but what should that person do is a different question and, it, and it, sometimes it's a different answer. So um, try not to tell them what to do from your perspective. Try and help them find a solution uh, from theirs. And if they find it without your help, brilliant. Um, try and help them become more uh, self-reliant and and give them freedom to to work things out themselves. But you're there to help if you need it. And I, I, you know, there's a, there's different scenarios every day. But you know, sometimes sometimes less is more. And don't walk around like you know everything. And I think that's one of the pitfalls that ex players can can sometimes fall into. Obviously, you're there for your experience and your knowledge. Um, one of the challenges I have is you know, sometimes I feel like I'm not working, but 
when you think about you're actually thinking about things all the time and we're used to being physically active and we, we associate yeah. that with with work um but there's a bit more to it than that um but you know don't stick your oar in too much and let people play yeah which which is what you as a player you 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 always seem to be able to work it out for yourself and you know you, you, there are a few guidelines from from some things and one of the one of the areas I want to talk to you about, Chappie, is that you, you've mentioned a couple of great bowlers that you played with, but you've you took the new ball with with uh, with, with some fantastic bowlers um, over the years at Lancashire. Uh, not to mention England's finest ever bowler that you you're working with as an England England coach at the moment, and also one of the the finest all rounders, if not one of the best left arm seamers of all time in Wazim Akram. Working with those that those quality performers did that help your career? Yeah, Wazim was a was a big influence early on. Um, he was a little bit too good because you couldn't copy him. So, um, <laughs> but he, you know, he he taught us a lot about the game, um, and just watching him was in, inspiring enough. And seeing you hopping around behind the stumps when I was at fine leg, <laughs> I felt for you and I felt for the slits, but. I've never seen anybody be able to generate pace on slow wickets into the wind like Wazim could. So we'd all we'd all look similar speeds to Wazim downwind on a fast pitch, but get him into the wind on a flat pitch and he was 20 mile an hour faster than us mm. and swinging it round corners. Yeah. So the beauty about playing in a team with Waz was you knew he'd take the hard stuff at the end of the innings. He'd bowl into the wind at the death um, and it would just get everybody else out of jail that. So he was that good. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was just a pleasure to see him perform really. Um, yeah. <coughs> Jimmy, watching him develop and how he's how he's learnt uh, to become as good as he is, uh, it's I mean it's still interesting now. Um, but how quickly he picked up the skills, and I know he he um, I know he often credits Winker with helping him develop his swing bowling. So um, <coughs> he went from being Tear away fast bowler who sprayed it around to being an internationally international class swing fast swing bowler in about eighteen months. Yeah. So his ability to learn really high level skills is is second to none. And his discipline in his career, discipline with his fitness and um his determination to stay at the top has been has been amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Wise words, and uh, and like you say, you've you've been in, at the helm now at, at Lancashire for, for a while, and you've got a a crop of very good young cricketers that you've you've moulded and shaped into, with you with your backroom team, you've shaped into a very very good unit by the look of it. What's your uh, what's your hopes and, and plans for that team moving forward? Um. Well, I was pretty hopeful for this year, if I'm honest. I thought we were in a really good place. We we played really good cricket last year in 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 all formats, actually. Um, mm. And I thought we had a well balanced squad going into this season. Uh, we'd signed a good we'd signed good overseas players, so we were in really good shape. We just we'd just been to Mumbai on a week's training camp, and um, just before all this. Uh, lockdown kicked off we were in really good shape now that still remains the case for next year we've we've, we've got a, a really strong squad um, but we're going to spend the rest of this season hopefully winning games of cricket and doing really well um, but without the overseas players and potentially with our England players missing for some of it uh, it'll give our lads more of our lads a chance to to play first team cricket um, and it'll enable us to see where we're at uh, going into the winter and into next season, um, and hopefully we can we can come into next year even stronger. Uh, you know, with a with a squad capable of of winning trophies, That's and obviously, fantastic. Yeah. you know, I think I think next year there'll be there'll be eighteen hungry counties. Um, mm. You know, and it'll be it'll be interesting to see how teams go. We've got to make sure that we're we're hungry than anyone else, um, because we should have we should have the quality, um, and everyone will be looking forward to a full season. And hopefully, that's uh, that's what we're going to get. 
Absolutely, yeah. The, the role on 2021, I think that's everyone's thought on, on, a, on a cricket front. But but let's move on to the, just uh, um, you, you're looking after the England bowlers at the minute and uh, head coach Chris Silverwood, it's your home ground, you've bowled here for the last... Fifty odd years. Is he? Uh, is he? Is he uh, picked your brains on 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 how the wicket may play and, uh, and what areas that we would gain a, an advantage on the West Indies? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, th- there is that aspect of it, but you know, I know the I know the venue. Um, obviously, I know the pitches, but we've also got Jimmy here, who's fairly clued up. You know, so yeah. I've never played a test match at Old Trafford. Um, five-day cricket's different to four-day cricket. So a lot of the time, our county games on a, on a good Old Trafford pitch, you think, how can we best um, force a result in four days? Whereas a five-day game is, is slightly different. It's more about establishing um, big first in score. And you've obviously got a really strong uh, bowling unit as well. Um, <coughs> But yeah, hopefully, uh, because of where we're at, I'll be I'll be of more help than than I would be at, at other places. So that's you know that's one of the reasons I'm here is just to try and help as best I can. Um, but I need to get I need to get uh, get older Stuart Broad this afternoon because he's he's stuck a picture on the Instagram of me and then put a picture of Boris Johnson on beneath it. So I don't <laughs> like it. I think he's saying I need it. Yeah. yeah, it has been noted, and and Wisdom Cricket as well have put put, put something on. <laughs> Who does this man look like? Yeah, well, so get him I think it's a bit harsh that now the now the hairdressers are open, we're still uh, we're still locked in for three more weeks. <laughs> get it shaved off, mate. Get number three all over. Before you finish, well, I want to I want to I want to just touch on on what it meant to you to like you say you played until you were forty one year old, uh, and you probably could have gone on a little bit longer. I think you were. You were so many wickets from uh, from reaching a thousand uh, thousand wickets, which is never happening again. A new, a new a new bowler will not get near a thousand. Um, so, what did it mean to actually put on the red rose shirt and, and go out there and play for Lancashire? Um, well, obviously, you know you should be pl- you should be proud to play professional cricket and proud to play for your home county. Um, and also the players you're playing with. And that builds up over the years. You know, you become a one-county player um, and all your stats are based at that ground. So, you know, it gets more and more intrinsic all the way through. You know, you have a you have a drive to do well for the club. And when I became captain, obviously, I had this, this urge to make sure we actually achieved something that we hadn't done for a long time. And thankfully, due to a lot of... Uh, exceptional circumstances and the players we had that year we we managed to do it in 2011 um i could have gone on for longer uh i just felt a little bit embarrassed to be chasing a ball to the boundary at 41 um when we had we had fairly strong squad of bowlers coming through the last five games i played i i played towards the end of the season i think i broke my finger early on um and we were in division two at the time and we, we, by the time my finger healed, we were going well, and the the, the bowlers who'd come through and, and replaced myself and people like Kyle Hogg and and Saj Mahmood, they were they were starting to to uh, build a uh, build a reputation and getting better week in week out, and it just didn't feel like the right thing to do to come wading back into the team that was that was improving. I uh, managed to get five games in when injuries allowed me to play. Um, but uh, going into the following season at 42, it just didn't. It just didn't feel like the right thing to be hanging on to. Um, you can always go on a bit longer than um, than you do, but I think I'd had my fair. I think I'd had a fair crack at it, to be honest. It would have you been know, nice to get out in wickets, but um, if you can't do it in 24 seasons, maybe you don't deserve it. <laughs> Well, that's that's really honest. That's a really honest point of view, mate. And you know, you gave your heart and soul to the club, and you were you were the go-to bowler for, for, for many many years, and led from the front. You've said it. You said yourself. You you you, uh, you played cricket how you expect everyone else to play cricket, and and that that, that was very admirable of you. Uh, Glenn Chapman, brilliant to speak to you, mate. Delighted that you've uh, 
that you're, you're helping the England bowlers out, but don't do too well because they want to see you back at uh, Red Rose for many years, many years to come. And you know, we, you've got jobs there that you were, uh, I'm sure you want to finish. But thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks for speaking uh, out of the England bubble. And I hope it goes great for you the next two weeks. I know I know you for a long time. I know you you enjoy walking the dog and you, you enjoy your game of golf and and you enjoy your pint. And they're gonna have to go on hold for the next two weeks, I think, mate. Yeah, we'll get through it, but you book us a tea time, mate. <laughs> don't worry, I'll book you two. I'll book I don't you want to, two. I don't want to hear you playing at Birkdale or somewhere when I'm when I'm when I'm free to play. Well, Unless next time. I'll... <laughs> All right, I've got plenty <laughs> in, but don't tell anyone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Happy. Thanks, pal. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers, mate.